All right. So here we go. We're in 6.1. We are shifting gears now. So the first part of calculus, right? Calculus can be sort of, you know, branched into two categories, right? One is derivatives and slope, which is what we did. Slope, which we found using derivatives. The other is area, which is what we're going to start today. So this is, you know, like the second half of calculus. And then, um, you know, once we do some stuff from this chapter, we'll be able to have, um, we'll be able to tackle like those AP style problems where they just ask you everything in one question. Um, okay, so let's do this. Um, we're gonna start talking about distance traveled. So look at this first example that we have here, right? We're gonna start with like the most basic trivial example. Um, so suppose you have a train moving along a track at a steady rate of 75 miles per hour. And from seven to 9 a.m., what is the total distance traveled by the train? Well, okay, so here we have, you know, our rate is 75 miles per hour. And if it's going from seven to nine, then I know that T is equal to two. And you've learned from your like algebra one days, right? That distance equals rate times time. So distance is 75 miles per hour times two hours. That's 150 miles. Yes? Okay. And you could have done that in your head with no equation, but you know, this is math class. This is where you would use the equations. All right, so let's connect that to the graph of the um, velocity function. And I know those of you that are taking physics are doing this sort of thing right now, probably, yes? So um, this train is moving at a rate of 75 miles per hour. So V of T for this train is a constant 75. And if you graph that, that's what it looks like. If this is 75 on the velocity axis, this is V of T is equal to 75. Now, if we're going to look at the interval from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., that's this, right? And look, so this is the chunk that we're looking at. Okay, now what shape is that? Um, okay, so what does this represent? That interval over there, that's two hours. And what does this represent? That's a height or a, you know, or a length of 75 miles per hour. So suppose I wanted to find the area underneath this curve, the area of that rectangle. What's area? Area is base times height, right? If you have a random rectangle like out in your yard, the area is base times height. So now in this case, what's our base? Two hours times what's the height? 75 miles per hour. So look at what happens by just finding geometric area, right? What does that translate to? This is 75. What does that translate to mathematically? 150 miles, right? So look, that's a major thing, right? That tells you that the area under a curve, if you have a velocity versus time graph, the area represents total distance traveled, right? So the distance traveled by the train is exactly the area of the rectangle, okay? Now, okay, fine. That was easy enough because that train was traveling at a steady 75 miles an hour. But what if you have something that is not traveling at a constant rate? What if the train had a velocity that varied as a function of time, right? Not everything's gonna be, you know, 
straight 75 miles an hour the whole time. What if it looked like this, that velocity curve? Then if I looked at the interval from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., right? If I looked at the area under that curve, now I've established that the area under a curve represents distance. Here I got lucky because the shape under it was a rectangle. But now I need to find the area of that irregular shape. Well, how am I going to do that? That's no longer a rectangle, right? But would the area of this irregular region still give the total distance? Well, yes, right? It's just easier to find when it's a rectangle. So, Isaac Newton and Leibniz, who, you know, isn't given much credit, um, they both looked at nature and they both came to the conclusion simultaneously, well, at the same time, but independently of one another, that yes, you can find the area underneath this curve and it would represent total distance. And so, you know, there's like this um, controversy between who really invented calculus. Was it Newton? Was it Leibniz? We always credit it to Newton. They were both, they both arrived at the same conclusion at the same time. They both published their papers relatively at the same time. But then, you know, um, royal, powers, higher powers that be came into play and they endorsed Newton versus the other. So there was a little bit of politics. So it's like a controversy in the math world, but they both should get like equal credit for it, right? It wasn't as easy as an apple falling on Newton's head. There was, you know, like if that's just fascinating. Like Einstein, he also like was fighting, you know, with other people to get, you know, credit, who would get credit for it. It's like a major thing. Anyhow. So here's what they did, both of them simultaneously, right? But independently of each other. So suppose you have that curve and we now have to find the area of that region from seven to nine. What they did was they said this, okay, if it was a straight rectangle, I could find the area. So they said, you know what? What if I divide this region into many, and when I say many, I'm talking nearly infinite region, right? So you divide that interval from 79, seven to nine into multiple subintervals. Now, here's what you do. You make each one of those a rectangle, right? When you make each one of those a rectangle, and if you find the rectangle of, if you find the area of each one of those rectangles, and if you add up all of the tiny little areas, then you get a pretty darn close approximation of the area under this curve, right? So that's the idea. The idea is if I draw one rectangle, that's not gonna work. But if I draw thousands of minuscule rectangles, find the area of each, add them up, then I get a pretty close approximation. And that is the gist of the second part of calculus that we're talking about. It's finding area using, you know, infinite number of rectangles under a curve, okay? Is it tedious? Yeah, to find the area of like, infinite number of rectangles, base height, base height, base height, base height, and then add them all up, yeah, but that's the idea, okay? So um, what happens is if you take one of these rectangles then, right, the area of the rectangle is base times height, just because, and the base represents the length on the x-axis or the t-axis, so basically in the independent variable. And then the h is determined by the function. 
right? So for example, if I want the height here, what's the height? Well, I take the X value, plug it into the function, and I get the height. Okay, this is V of T, okay? All right. So that brings us to what we call rectangular approximation, rectangular approximation method or RAM, right? Because we like cute little abbreviations of things. Um, and again, you know, you have the width and the height that, that are represented by the independent and the dependent variables. Okay, now, once you've got your in, um, intervals and you're drawing your rectangles, you can draw rectangles in different ways. So for example, if I have a function like this and I have my intervals, right? Take a look at this first interval here, right? That has heights right to the left and right. Look at the blue. Um, yeah, Chloe, I, I feel you. That's why I'm recording it. So don't worry, just keep coming back. So look at the blue intervals, right? Now I need to cap this off from the top and make it a rectangle. I have two options. I can either do it from the left side and my rectangle looks like that. Or I can do it from the right side and my rectangle looks like that. Do you see that? Or I can do it using the midpoint. So that's why I have three different approximations. I can use the left end point and I call that LRAM, that's how we pronounce it. I can use the right endpoint and I call that RRAM or the midpoint and I call it MRAM, right? So for, the, for LRAM, I use left endpoints to determine the height. RRAM use right endpoints to determine the height or the midpoint. Okay, let's just do one. It's really a lot simpler than it seems on paper. Okay, estimate the area under the curve f of x equals x squared, our favorite parabola, right? Here we go, that's x squared. From zero to three, you have to be given an interval. And this is n, how many subintervals? So I'm going to divide the region from zero to three into six parts. Okay, so first what you have to do is figure out the base of the rectangle. And that's done by taking your A and B of the intervals. And you do B minus A over six, right? So each interval has a width of a half. That means, look here, the region from zero to three is divided into six. So each one of these is a length of one half. So I have an endpoint at a half, one, three over two, two, five over two. Okay. All right. So now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do my LRAM. Okay, each time, right? So if this is my first rectangle here, I'm gonna use the left endpoint. Here is the left endpoint of that rectangle. What's the X value? Zero. To get the height of the rectangle, I have to plug that value into the equation. So here's how it's gonna work. It's base times height, right? The base has a length of a half. And what's the height? It's the end point plugged into the equation x squared, so zero squared. Plus, now I go to the second rectangle here. What's the left end point? One half. So base is a half, height is the end point squared. 
plus third rectangle. Base is a half. Height is the left end point squared. Plus, next one, fourth rectangle. Base is a half. Left end point squared. You guys getting the idea? Next rectangle, number five. Base is a half. Left end point of the rectangle squared. And then the last one, number six, half left end point squared. Right? Okay, what happened? Look at the endpoints. Look at the look at the x values here. When I did L ramp, I started from the leftmost point and I used every single point on the interval until second to the last one. And here, how many terms do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six for each of the subintervals. You put it on your calculator, 6.875. Okay, RM. Wait, why don't you do um, three? Um, because, so the last one I did was for this rectangle, right? Number six, that's the endpoint I use. Because we're doing L ram, you use the left endpoint. Okay, now we're gonna do the right endpoints. So um, the points here again are zero, one half, one, three over two, five over two, no, two, and then five over two. Okay. This first rectangle, right? Base is a half. Right. Now I'm gonna take the right end point, this one, the one half squared, plus second rectangle, base is a half times the right end point, one squared. Next one, half three over two squared, and you keep going. So now one, two, three. Now I'm in the fourth rectangle here. Half two squared plus the fifth rectangle is half five over two squared plus the final rectangle six is half three squared. So what happened with this? Since it's R ram, I started with one over, right? One to the right. And I end up using the last one, right? So it's just shifted to the right one. This is 11.375. So look at this. Both of these represent the area under the curve. Now the area under this curve has one value, right? One, but look at this one. Elrond gave me 6.9. This is 11.4. So do you see how one is an under approximation? One is an over approximation because on the top, if I level off my rectangles this way, I have all this empty space that I'm not accounting for. But if I level my triangles to the right, then I have all this extra space, okay? So what's a good compromise? MRAM, right? MRAM, you take the midpoints. So look, these were zero, one half, one, three over two, and so on. Now for the heights, we're gonna take the midpoints, a quarter, I'm going to erase these and just write the midpoints. So it's less cluttered. Three over four, five over four, seven over four, nine, and 11 over four. 
So now NREM is half. Okay, the base of each one is a half, right? And you see how here I keep doing half, half, half. I can just factor those out, right? So I, I you know, less ink, less blood, less time. I'm gonna factor out the halves and just gonna um, add up the heights. So it's one fourth squared, three fourths squared. Okay. Seven over four, nine over four, and 11 over four squared. So now I'm just doing the midpoints. And this is 8.9375. All you need is three decimals. I went four. Okay, so do you see how that's a happy medium between the two? So what would you say is the best approximation for this curve for all these? MRAM. MRAM. Right? And you know, we'll get into more and more of this, but you know, depending on how the curve looks. LREM might be an over approximation or an under approximation. And the AP folk love asking those twisted questions on multiple choice tests. If you have a curve that's increasing concave up, blah, 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 you know, which of these is an under approximation and so on. So, you know, little by little, we'll get into more detail. Okay. Another thing is this was a continuous function. Sometimes you just have discrete values. A model train engine here moving along the track for 10 seconds, estimate the distance traveled by the engine using 10 sub intervals of length one with LRAM and RRAM. So here you have the discrete values given to you, right? But how do these look? So look, you have the time and you have the velocity. So basically it's like this. When t is zero, the velocity is four. When t is one, the velocity is 12. Okay. And then, so when I do my rectangles, right? Basically like gonna look like this. Okay, so we could still do rectangles. Now, let me show you what you need to look for. Two things. First, you need to look for the interval. Are they regular intervals? The zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to four, it's going up by one. These on the time axis represent the bases, right? And here for each one, t is equal to one. So my base is equal to one. These values represent the heights. Okay, so for part A for LRAM, it's gonna be the base one times the sum of all the heights. Since it's LRAM, I start from the leftmost point, which is four. And I'm just going to go down the list and just add up all of the heights until I get to second to the last one. So four, 12, 22, 10, 5, 13, 11, 6, 2, 6. That's it. Okay, because it's LRAM, we're not gonna take the last one. That's 91 inches. Um, for RRAM, it's one again, but now I start from the 12, right? One over and I go over to the last one. Okay. Okay, and that is 87 inches. So 
questions? Okay. Um, a particle starts at zero and moves along the x-axis with a velocity of six for t is greater than or equal to zero. Where is the particle at six? So if I were to graph this, this is V of T. Um, if it's continuously moving at a constant rate, then V of T is six. And it starts at zero. We want to know where is it at six? So basically, how much has it traveled from zero to six? That's where it is, right? I want the area underneath. So D is six times six, 36. That's really all you need for these. Oh, look at the next one. A particle starts at zero and moves along the x-axis with a velocity of this. Oh my, it's no longer a constant velocity. Well, let's see what that looks like. Let's graph that. V of t and v. Negative 2t plus 6 means its y-intercept is 6. And this is a decreasing linear curve, right? But um, when y is 0, x is, what, 3. Ms. Malikian, is the x-axis supposed to be t? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so this is the x or the t intercept. So that's what that looks like. Right? From 0 to 3. So now look, if the distance traveled is the area under that curve, oh my god, I've got a triangle now. Can I find the area of a triangle? Do I even need calculus for this? No. The distance is half times base times height, 9. Um, do you guys do stuff like this in physics or not yet? A little? We do, we did um, velocity time graphs. Uh -huh. um, did like the, we did the velocity, we did the acceleration. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of easy because like the, the calc kids just did like the due to derivatives of everything, I think, where everybody else just had to do it like regularly but um we haven't done anything like this though awesome okay a car comes to a stop 10 seconds after the driver applies the brakes while the brakes are on the velocities of the car are listed below use a midpoint approximation with five sub intervals of equal length to estimate the distance the car traveled while the driver, the driver was braking. Okay, so look, subintervals. Okay, so we have 10 seconds and we want it to be um, five subintervals, right? That means, um, whoa, the subintervals, if we're dividing 10, by five, each has a length of two, okay? So from zero to two is one subinterval, two to four is another, four to six is another, six to eight and eight to 10. Is that five? It is five. But now I want midpoint approximation. Okay, midpoint approximation means I take the midpoint of each interval, right? So if I go from zero to two, midpoint is one. Two to four, midpoint is three. Four to six, midpoint is five. How often does this stuff show up on AP tests? 
A lot. Okay, a lot. Um, okay, so NREM. The seven of them, that's the base. So it's two times. Now we want to add up the respective heights. So it's 76 plus 57 plus 42 plus 29 plus 3. That's two times 207, 414 feet. So on an AP calculus test, in a free response test, they'll start with a table like this, a very innocent looking table. And then they'll ask you like part A, you know, use left-hand approximations to approximate blah, you know, then things get bad. And then, you know, they start asking you things from like, chapter two, and then another one from chapter seven, and then another one from chapter four. And then, you know, and they're all things where you, EVT comes into play. And they're all things where, you know, how well have you like understood? So again, it's less about the final answer, but more about like understanding the concept, you know? Okay. Here we go. Table below, records the velocity of a car in miles per hour at different time intervals over 25 seconds. Use LRAM to approximate the total distance traveled. And here, you know, there is a little hint for you. First time you get a hint, then you don't get a hint. Note the difference in unit. Yes, because this is miles per hour and this is seconds. So they're since we're multiplying the two, we're going to have issues later. So first thing first, we're going to do LRAM, right? So first, take a look at your intervals. Are they regular intervals? Well, no, because the first case, P is 4, and then T is 2, and then 3, 1. Right? Let's just do these because we're going to end up. Then T is four, three, three, one, and then finally T is four. Okay, so now we still have rectangles. I can still do base height, base height, base height, base height, but now my rectangles have varying uh, widths, right? And before when I was telling you about these rectangles, um, I never ever ever said they had to be of equal length, right? They don't have to be of equal length. The math works just fine. Okay, so we have to go ahead and find the areas then. So here's what we're gonna do, LREM, means we start from the left-hand point, so the first endpoint of zero, right? First height of zero. All right, so the first um, base length is four times zero plus two times 20 plus three times 31 plus one times 47 so I'm taking a base and one height, four times 50, three times 52, three times 54, one times 60, and then four times 56. It's like magic, they're gonna add up. I mean, they're gonna match up perfectly, right? This is LRM, so yeah, I stopped one short, Okay, this is 982, but 982 of what, right? We were multiplying time, which is in seconds, and then velocity, which is miles per hour. So this is seconds times miles per hour. I'm solving for distance. Well, I can't cancel these, can I? No. So what I need to do is I need to convert the hours into seconds, right? Um, one hour, 
is how many seconds these days? Well, I mean, in pandemic time, one hour feels like it's 500 million seconds, mm-hmm. right? But under normal conditions, in non-pandemic times, it was 3,600, right? So what are we gonna do here? One hour is 3,600 seconds, hours cancel, seconds cancel, we end up in miles, but it's 982 over this many miles. So this is 0.2727 miles. If you're asked to provide your answer in feet, what's the conversion? Miles to feet? 5,280. Yep, 5,280. It's 1,440.27 feet. Don't even get me started on these, you know, conversion factors for the British system.